In the beginning, there was chaos. The fact that we've been raised to believe certain things about the country that suddenly appeared to not be true at all, you know, we're all created equal. What had been okay the other way, all of a sudden I could see the injustice. We were the radicals, the revolutionaries. It was putting your body on the line and it changed all of us. It changed a generation, a big part of that generation. So what, what makes a feminist a feminist? People will answer that differently. This is also one that I spend a lot of time thinking about. <laughs> would you consider yourself a feminist? I would. Uh, I try not to tell a whole lot of people. Why? Well, all right. I don't walk up and be like, hey, guess who's a feminist? This guy. When we think of feminism as something that only belongs to women, but I think it's something that's both for men and women. We should all be on the same equal playing field when it comes to our careers, our lifestyles. I think a truthful feminism is just understanding that women are also people that are brilliant and can do all sorts of things, but are also different. And like understanding that different is not bad. Different is just different. At last, to move history forward for women. Feminism is gaining traction, and I'm very proud that I never called myself anything else. I, I have so much hope to, have, to see that rising up now. Uh, and there was a period where I, I think a lot of us looked around and went, what happened? <laughs> what happened to the 60s or the 70s? And now you can clearly see, I mean, they, they do have an interest in this kind of history. There are lessons to be learned from it. Students had opportunities to meet with their forebears, their foremothers, to connect with people and have that personal experience. And more than anything you could read in a, in a book, get the, the feeling of what it was like there. Most of us who entered college in the early 1960s didn't realize what was to come. We had a new president, John Kennedy, the youngest in modern times. Most of the young people who were politically active on the campuses were conservatives, whose heroes were Bill Buckley and Barry Goldwater. But then in November 1963, John Kennedy was assassinated. A year later, Barry Goldwater was overwhelmingly defeated in his bid for the presidency. And by 1965, the war in Vietnam had gotten out of control. The time was ripe for the emergence of the new left. And we're hoping to get Austin's activism of the 60s and 70s more on the map than it currently is. And most of the students are going to be challenging some kind of existing narrative. And I'm guessing that some of you here maybe have already been frustrated with a narrative that either misinterprets or does not interpret at all. So history, um, as a field, loves to study established structures of power because they're easy. There are two important things that the established narrative forgets, and those are the importance of public space and of community. With love, we will listen. With wisdom, we will decide. Women began to to sit in rooms together and talk. Consciousness raising groups where women began to understand their story as a social structure. You're in a framework that is like a prison, you know, under patriarchy. Women are, whether they like it or not, because you got all these barriers and you got all these things that, that encircle you, you know, and you have all these expectations. Pick something, pick what's happening to resources for women, and the concept that women should have control over their bodies, birth control, Planned Parenthood, sex discrimination, or 
sexual abuse in workplaces. I mean, it's, but I mean, you just pick, pick, pick a thread. And if it happens to motivate you, you will probably find it is connected to other threads. And it is in the figuring that out and uh, figuring out that you can do something about it. With vision and courage, we will seek equality and justice for all. We will seek equality and justice for all. I vastly underestimated the power of one person. When people do anything, you know, they end up touching the lives of those around them in big or small ways. Student power movements or free speech movements would look, they would have learned lessons from the black struggle and the women's movement learned lessons from the black struggle and the anti-war struggle. From my perspective, it was the civil rights movement that laid the foundation for all the movements that, that came after that. And I think that even though it's so awful right now, people should not lose hope and, and they should be activists. And I just think there's real, maybe I'm wrong, but I think there's like a parallel or it's just the feelings are similar, the urgency. All the issues are all the same. I think activists just kind of roll into the movements and the movements are never clear cut. They weren't isolated. They were very, uh, you know, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, and uh, and helped us form long, long, <laughs> long, 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 life, life long, life long. I, I don't speak English. So well. <laughs> <laughs> like, after six o'clock, my English kind of goes away. I think there's this passion of young people and the way that they might start on one issue and then that might change their views on other issues and on the so society in general. What does democracy look like? What would it be like if we changed society? What if there was really equality? So how do you make change is really the question. We rabble roused continuously and got in trouble for it. I do have a 100 page FBI file and I couldn't get a security clearance for a government position when I graduated from law school for the honors program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it has a lot of stuff about the women's movement in it. It's really outrageous in the sense that we were just running around talking about women's rights law. There's nothing about committing any crimes or any other kind of illegal activity, but I was classified as disloyal number three, known to sympathize with members of the Communist Party or something crazy like that. Some of it's funny and some of it's not. It's like, Women's Liberation is a group uh, dedicated, it's something like, to defeat male chauvinism and burning bras or something like crazy. And, you know, and they deliberately, like, uh, don't wear makeup. It was such an unsophisticated, stupid kind of analysis. Those women who want all the rights do not need any spokesman for them for they are making themselves heard loud and clear about abortion, lesbianism, and homosexuality. Shouting about the amendments and flag-waving makes tremendous publicity. But remember that church, apple pie, morals, and motherhood made this country. That opened my eyes to what women were facing in the post-war America and even now. For me, the big takeaway was just the different ways that these young women partook in activism. What we had was a tiny little room where we did abortion and birth control counseling. Our idea was really to be a birth control counseling center, not an abortion counseling center. Abortion access became one of the things that people, you know, would call desperate, like where, where can I get an abortion? And it was illegal in Texas. It really evolved organically. It was really that women um, were coming and asking these questions. Where can I get abortion? I'm pregnant people in this birth control information center would accompany women to Mexico or San Antonio. They were young, they were desperate. I remember a high school student from Lockhart and I thought, wow, who was pregnant? I thought, wow, that's a long way to come. This young woman scenario exemplifies the difficulty that many young women in the pre-Row era experienced because the abortion laws were so harsh. There was a lot of risk. Well, we were worried about our liability 
um, under conspiracy laws or aiders and abettors? Like, what was our responsibility for giving this information to women? Sarah Weddington was one of the few lawyers that we knew. And so we met with her about our liability, trying to figure out like what would ha could happen to us. There it was like, wow, it'd be really interesting to challenge the abortion laws. They basically talked Sarah Weddington, who was very young, into taking a, the case of, of Roe v. Wade to the Supreme Court, and I think it shocked everybody. I would have assumed that it would come from a more liberal state. I even told my parents, who are both from the South, and they had no clue. My mom didn't believe me. I'm like, no, I wrote my, I did my final paper on this in an interview. I think I'm right. From birth control to uh, changes on abortion access, we brought attention to that, and then we begin to make changes, and then women begin to meet together and on domestic abuse. Our Mexican-American group uh, in Austin, Mex Mexican-American business and professional women, we also did research and opened up the Rape, Rape Crisis Center, the Center for Better Women, that's what they call it then, it's such an ugly name, and now they're merged into Safe Place. So there was a huge impact on trying to train police officers to not uh, victimize the victim. That was a big deal to negotiate services for rape uh, victims and for uh, victims of domestic abuse. The real change that happened was that we all grew up figuring out that the difference we could make, it wasn't gonna happen through channels that took forever and muted our activism. I think the movement accomplished a lot of entry of women into politics. I think the movement accomplished passage of the ERA in 38 states. It accomplished a great deal in a very short uh, period of time. The backlash was almost immediate. I remember I was in law school in Boston um, when Roe v. Wade was announced. Um, I remember how excited we were and thinking now we can move on to the next issue. And of course, there's been a constant assault on women's reproductive rights since that decision. Women's rights, when you look at it as a long-term social justice movement, you know, two steps forward and one step back. But I think really there has been a, a seismic change in women's rights. I think what's gonna transform patriarchy and, and maybe get rid of it as a system of social control that's what it is, it's a system of social control, will be that, that not just single women saying this, but a lot of women and men growing up in, a, in an environment and then developing that awareness within that environment. And if they don't do it within the home, Maybe there are other environments in school where they hear other children talk. If you don't have education, a high quality education, then that's where inequalities come out of. And I think we can resolve a lot, a lot of issues through education and education reform. When, when I got involved with the women's movement, I think all of us went, wow, no one ever told us about the suffragists. We never learned it in school. We never learned they had a connection to the abolitionists. Nobody ever told us. If there's a women's history course that is in a high school, I would be very impressed. Usually, women's history in high school textbook is like a blurb over to the side, like, hey, did you know that there was also a woman involved in all these events that men did? Remembering that a lot of those, the people in the movement had been students, and so, you know, these were people who were both activists and intellectuals. That starting in the, the late 70s, there were anthologies created. This is a way of making inroads so that we can arrive at real American studies. We need to know the stories of different women, and if we only focus on white women, we are doing damage. We are acting like that's a universal story, and it's it's a particular story. I mean, in my view, to talk about white women as a whole is crazy anyway, because there's region, there's religion, 
there's um, class. A lot of ethnic studies deal with class issues because that's where, the, that's where we get divided from the ruling privileged class. It'll shine light on American history and what it is not, and American social studies, what it's not. I'm hoping that the new emphasis on social justice and ethnic studies too will emphasize that one of the things about being empowered is supporting your civic community. Let us celebrate woman power and let us make this conference the beginning of a stage in our quest for making democracy the thing it should be and should have been 200 years ago. We have that charge. We will make that charge work. This is the time that we will make women and men share equally in the greatness of America. Thank you very, very much. There's a future where this is a, like a diverse and forward-thinking country that is powerful but wields that power in a responsible way that understands its place in the world and how it can be helpful without being overbearing. And you see flashes of it. We need a rebirth of hope. We need to rekindle people's imagination. And I think we have a great talent out there. What happened in the 60s changed us at the molecular level. <laughs> we became, I always go, addicted <laughs> to uh, the concept that we could change things. And I think when, when you inject that into people, it's magical. We're in a global world now, and the, the, the more we connect forces and knowledge, the better off we'll be, because we can change anything. And this time, America, this time, America. we will not be denied. We will not be denied.